Given the crisis facing our Atlantic salmon stocks, everything really needs to be done to protect them. Our magnificent wild salmon have fought their way up our rivers and fired our imaginations for thousands of years, but they're now on a path to extinction. For the sake of our natural heritage and for future generations, we have a duty to take action where we can. To make that action effective, we must find out where our salmon are and when. And it's critical that we know their numbers, health and condition in a fast-changing situation. We need good evidence to understand where our wild salmon populations are doing well and where they're struggling. In some cases, monitoring is designed to help address important local pressures. In other cases, local fisheries trusts and district salmon fishery boards collect information which feeds into local, national and international salmon management. Where we need to address pressures on our wild salmon, the appliance of science can be a big help in getting action that makes a difference. Sea lice are natural parasites of salmon and sea trout, but fish farming can mean that the number of sea lice in the environment increase to levels that are damaging to our wild salmon and sea trout populations. West Coast Fisheries Trust have been monitoring sea lice and wild fish for many years. Sea lice levels on wild fish are not always a cause for concern. However, there are situations where things go badly wrong and the resulting impacts can be devastating for our wild salmon and sea trout. We're specifically here today because there's been a huge outbreak of lice on the nearby farm and we wanted to see what impact that's having on the wild fish. With the same net we row the net out into a semicircle, pull it in and hope that we've got some fish and then we look at all of those fish, count them, measure them which is very important and basically work out the lice burden per gram of fish because that's what gives us the indication about how likely it is to survive or not. I'm really passionate about trying to find these solutions and make our data that we've collected today, make it mean something, make it mean something not only to me, but to people in the Scottish Government um, and to people working on the fish farm. What we really need is a robust regulatory system, so we're not just relying on the goodwill of the fish farm companies, but we actually have some way of enforcing these regulations. Realistic lice targets, which are based on protecting wild fish. At the minute, all of the lice targets are just for farmed fish. They're not at all based on protecting wild fish. And we need that system to change, and we need Scottish Government to implement that. If people came out here today and saw these lice on these fish, they would be sickened by it. You know, and they would want to do something to improve it. Because it just shouldn't be like that. You know, in such a natural, beautiful place, we have to be able to do better. And I genuinely think we can, I just think that we need some support. So in many cases, fisheries managers don't have the powers to address pressures on our wild salmon by themselves. We therefore have to make the case for action to be taken forward by the relevant regulator. Another important method that we use to monitor our wild salmon is electrofishing, which provides us with crucial information to assess the health of juvenile fish populations in our rivers. Fisheries biologists use a very mild electric current in the water to temporarily stun fish, which are then carefully netted out for further assessment. This includes taking measurements of each individual fish and counting the number of fish at different life stages. Electrofishing is undertaken according to strict protocols developed by the Scottish Fisheries Coordination Centre. This is one of the most widespread monitoring techniques in Scotland and provides valuable local information about the health of our rivers. Using this technique, our members also contribute to the National Electrofishing Programme for Scotland, an annual assessment by Marine Scotland Science of the status of our juvenile salmon populations. Sometimes farmed fish can escape into the wild and can harm wild fish populations through competition for resources and breeding with local wild salmon. 
when farmed salmon breed with wild salmon, the offspring are less likely to survive, which could contribute to a further decline of our wild salmon populations. The DNA of juvenile fish can be analysed to assess whether or not one or both of that individual's parents was a farmed salmon. Data collected through the National Electrofishing Programme has shown that escapes have altered the genetic composition of a number of populations within rivers near both marine and freshwater aquaculture production. The open cage aquaculture that we have here is not used in many areas and we would like the production here moved on land so that the, the industry can still continue to operate. It won't have a major effect on, on the industry but our, our salmon populations will, will be protected and will not have the, the risk, the very great risk they have at the moment of uh, introgression from uh, farm genes. At the moment, the emphasis has, has been on us to uh, prove that there is a problem and that there is an issue rather than the aquaculture industry demonstrating that there isn't an issue and that there isn't a problem. So we believe that's a completely unfair burden on ourselves and uh, SSE and other operators. We had a, a rather large escape, more than 48,000 salmon escaped uh, in August last year into the Firth of Clyde and very rapidly started to enter the Ayrshire rivers, uh, the Clyde system, some Argyll rivers, and that's very worrying because these fish, once they're in the rivers, um, may go on and breed with wild salmon, which would weaken the stock. That's the introgression aspect that we're monitoring here today. Or they could just remain in the river, the lower rivers, as we believe they did last uh, back end, predating on, on wild fish. We have to make sure that this introgression monitoring continues next year and, and for a few years thereafter, just to make sure that we are capturing uh, examples of introgression if they are occurring. So we've discussed ways in which we can monitor impacts and count and assess populations of fish, but recent advances in technology now allow us to accurately track where our fish are in rivers and at sea. So over the last four years we've been tracking the juvenile salmon smolts as they do their river migration and make it to sea, which begins here at Aberdeen Harbour. Although in three years we found the smolts were able to move through the harbour without any trouble and transition to the ocean, in one year, in 2018, we found that over a quarter, in fact 28% of those smolts never made it through that final leg of the journey. Part of the journey that's only one and a half miles long. The reason being that we lost so many smolts in 2018 appears to be that the annual maintenance dredging that's carried out by the Harbour Board every year happened in that year to coincide with the exact time that our tagged smolts were moving through the harbour. Our concerns were expressed in, in actual data and, and facts and that seemed to make quite a difference to the licensing team who granted a protection window for the smolt so that no dredging would be carried out during that critical smolt migration time. So for the last three years, we've had smolt protection during this really critical final end piece of their journey as they go out to sea. Given the crisis facing our Atlantic salmon stocks, everything really needs to be done to protect them which is why it's an unfortunate situation that the precautionary principle isn't applied more. So in this case, we actually had to prove that there was an impact on the salmon stocks to prevent damaging work being done. The River Tweed Commission has been around for the best part of 200 years. And in that time frame, that there has been a collection of data uh, Historically, it would have been a netting enterprise and, and fish would have been recorded uh, and, and uh, monitored for an economic return. Uh, today, we, we're far more interested in the science of the, the fish uh, and you know, the reasons why there's been a decline over the last you know, 20 years and really looking to see if there's something we can do in river to change that balance. We look at the life cycle from, from egg deposition, where the, the, the female fish will, will lay eggs, right through to the returning fish, which we uh, will we'll catch in river both by angling effort and by netting, and we'll, we'll use tags on those fish to try and determine where they move through the catchment. We move on to our electrofishing program, which will do exactly that. It'll tell us the survival rate of those, those eggs and how many hatched from Alvin to Fry to Parr, 
and then we measure them again as they leave the river as smolts uh, where they go off on that long journey to the North Atlantic. And an important part of the work we do in the gala is um, tagging fish and tracking fish using these pit tags, so passive integrated transponder tags. We can record as each individual tagged fish leaves the river and then hopefully when they return as well. So in 2019 we started this tagging and uh, last year we started to see a few fish return, so we had 10 fish return as grills. Um, and this year again we're, we're seeing a few fish return as grills but we're starting to see um, some multi-sea winter fish coming back as well, so uh, that's a really good news story. So this is the Gala uh, fish counter here, so at the top here we've got a set of scanners and that gives us the length data and that's also what counts the fish. And then here we've got a light tunnel with a camera attached uh, and that just enables us to get footage of the fish as they swim through so we can see the fish as they're being counted. And that's also really important so that we can identify which species of fish it is. So any pit tagged fish that we tag in the, in the spring during the smoke runs, um, as they return as adults, as they swim through the fish counter, uh, we can record the tag number, we can then get an image of the fish as it swims through, and of course it's counted. As the smolts start to run downstream, We've got this side channel here, so we take the boards out up the top and that opens the channel up. A proportion of the smolts come down there, hold up in this pool here, and then they'll eventually come down over this grill. They'll come into this, uh, into this water trough here, and then uh, the current will take them down and into this holding box here. Um, and this is, um, during the smolt run, we'll check this box daily. If there's lots of fish running, we'll check it more often as well. And this is where we get the, get the count of the smolts leaving and uh, we can measure the length of each fish as well and do any tagging. Salmon are, are hugely important in the river. In the Tweed there's, there's such a rich, rich history with, with salmon fishing and netting. It's really important to, to keep an eye on the, on the health of the fish stocks just to make sure that we're getting enough fish leaving the river um, to ensure that enough fish are coming back um, and, and spawn and keep the river, uh, keep the numbers healthy. So the River Tweed Commission and the Tweed Foundation find ourselves really well resourced to do the in-river work uh, that we do here on the Tweed and, and, and the, the tributaries. Uh, but we find ourselves uh, working with other rivers across Scotland who face similar, uh, if not absolutely identical problems. But the, the decline in salmon is something that we can't uh, overcome on our own. So we have to work with other, other boards across Scotland to maximise our effort, to maximise our financial resources as much as our human resources, and then to work with policy. Uh, Fisheries Management Scotland ease that, uh, that angst about working with, directly with politicians for us. They do it on our behalf and, and under our direction. And in that wider European context with, with NASCO, the North Atlantic Conservation Organisation uh, and, and ICES where uh, the, the research has been done in the sea. So working together, hopefully we can, we can find the answer uh, or one of the answers certainly that, uh, that will lead to a return in salmon. We are all determined to do everything we can to save our precious wild salmon from the threat of extinction. That will mean taking the right action at the right time and persuading some public bodies to take tough decisions. In some cases, that won't be easy. So in the battle for the future of this incredible species, cold, clear science will be one of our best weapons.